of John again <clears throat> in chapter 4. Some scripture is pretty straightforward when it comes to principles of application and we can look at it, do this, don't do that. Sometimes when we come to a scripture, we best can interpret it if we can like transport ourselves back to that time period where we, we feel what's going on. And I believe today is one of those days. We saw last week, and this week in chapter 4, it's just a continuation. It begins, therefore, all right? So it's just a continuation of what just happened. And last week we saw John the Baptist was uh, making disciples and baptizing in Enon, and we saw Jesus um, of Nazareth was about a mile away making disciples, baptizing in the Jordan River. And, and we saw that many more people were coming to Jesus than to John. And the Pharisees, taking note of all of this, came to John and, and tried to rise, cause something to rise up within him where he would go and he would try to shut down this movement of Jesus. But he would have nothing to do with that. So we get the idea that they were permitting John, they were allowing John to continue, probably because he was a known entity. If you remember who John was, his father was Zechariah, uh, the priest. His wife was Elizabeth, or John's mom was Elizabeth. And you remember the story of how John came into being. So even though they may not have cared for John, they cut him a little slack because they knew his dad and that his dad was a priest. But not so with Jesus. You see, Jesus was the new kid on the block, and he was, after all, from Nazareth. And nothing good comes from Nazareth. I don't say that tongue-in-cheek. That was their, their thought. And not only that, his father wasn't a priest. His father was a carpenter. So you can see they're not as willing to cut him slack. So you can sense that they're probably reasoning within themselves, how can we stop this? Therefore, stand with me if you would. Let's begin reading chapter 4. And I would like to pause after verse 6. So after verse 6 you may be seated. Therefore, and now you know what is speaking about for therefore. Therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself did not baptize but his disciples, he left Judea and he departed again to Galilee, but he needed to go through Samaria. He came to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar near the plot of ground that Jacob had given his son Joseph. And Jacob's well was there. And Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, sat thus by the well, and it was about the sixth hour. You may be seated. So just to reiterate what we have in these first six verses, either by his Jesus as being omniscient or word traveling fast, Jesus gets word of the Pharisees not being happy. Now there would be, as we know, a time in the future where a line would be drawn in the sand and Jesus would come hard against the Pharisees. But today was not going to be the day. For Jesus is just beginning his ministry here. So Jesus leaves Judea to go to Galilee. I want you to have an image in your mind today. I want you to think of Center Point, Walker, and Kwaski. All right? All in a row. Center Point is Judea. Walker is Samaria. And Kwaski is Galilee. And on the west side is the Mediterranean Sea. On the east side is the Wapsipinikin, or the Jordan River, all right? So in order to go from Judea to Galilee, you have three options. 
You can get in a boat and sail around it. You can go through it. Or like most Jews who refuse to go through Samaria, they refuse to engage Samaritans. After all, who were Samaritans? They were leftovers from the Assyrian takeover, and they intermarried. They were half-breed, for the most part, to go through Samaria. So they would rather cross the Jordan River and go around to get to Kwaski. All right? And that's what we have in our text today. Jesus said, I need to go through Samaria. What he's saying is, that isn't the only route. There are other routes. But what he's saying is, there's something I have to do in Samaria. So have that mindset as we get into our text today. And remember Romans 1.16, which says, the gospel is to the Jew first, and then the Gentile. Well, what had Jesus just done? I mean, John paints the picture that he is from above. And he testified of what he had seen and heard. But we see his testimony was rejected by the Jews, by the Pharisees, right? So now he's leaving the Jews and going to the Gentiles, so to speak. But the gospel was to the Jew first. And this woman that he was about to meet, that we'll be introduced to as we continue to read the scripture, she knew very well that this was out of the ordinary. But he needed to go through Samaria. Why did he need to go through Samaria? Well, in chapter 10, verse 16 of the Gospel of John, he tells his disciples, And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, and I must bring them in. Therefore, we have why Jesus needed to go through Samaria. Because some of God's elect were there, and they must be sought and found. We shall never fully appreciate the gospel until we understand the basic truth of predestination. It is his decision before it is our decision. Salvation, could, one could say, is a movement of the heart, but it is regulated by God's will. If you have a a mechanical mind here, like many of you uh, I know do, you you understand in an engine or in in a mechanical situation that one thing must happen before another can. Now, I grew up in small town uh, Delhi, not that far from here. But I had an aunt and uncle lived over by Central City that were farmers. And every summer, uh, I would go and spend a week on their farm. And I was fascinated with one of my uncle's tractors. It was an old John Deere hand crank. And he would put the crank in the front of the tractor. And with all of his might, he would hurl that crank. And what that did was actually turned a crank that had the pistons on it. And a piston would go up inside the cylinder. If you know anything about engines, it's a real tight fit. And as that crank was turned, that cylinder would go up, compress the air, and the gasoline that was put into the cylinder, and you actually had a mini explosion that drove that piston back down. Well, you ha- it fired, and then that kept the engine running, see? But it all started with a crank. So it is with salvation. If it isn't the Holy Spirit putting the crank into us, so to speak, We're just as dead as a cold block of steel. Think of Lazarus. Casey's mentioned that many times. Could have Lazarus came forth if Christ hadn't made him alive first? Absolutely not. And so it is with salvation. We're just as dead as Lazarus. We're just as dead as an engine that's not running until the Holy Spirit moves us to begin to respond, right? But it's his decision before it's our decision. Well, Jesus needed to go through Samaria because the field of Samaria was white unto the harvest, ready for laborers. And with this one stop, Christ was going to break down so many barriers. Barriers in the disciples' minds. Barriers that had existed for years. When Jesus said, this covenant in my blood is the new covenant, it was beginning here as he was beginning his ministry and he was beginning to show that so what was happening in samaria needed to happen to illustrate that jesus was savior of all 
all that would lift their eyes to the Savior lifted up like the serpent in the wilderness, as he told um, Nehemiah, say it, who was I'm thinking of? Nicodemus, there we go, I knew it began with the N, as he told Nicodemus. So, so far, if, if we look at the Gospel of John up to this point, we've seen a blinded priesthood, a joyless nation, a desecrated temple, and then as we saw last week, a spiritually dead Sanhedrin, the person of Christ despised and his testimony rejected. Israel, they had all the privileges, none the least of which was a written word, the written word of God. And yet, they rejected. They were a nation of religious ceremonialism with dead hearts. A nation that prided themselves on obedience to the commandments, and yet they failed to love their neighbor as themselves. In fact, they despised their neighbors, the Samaritans. So I refer now to the text that was read for us this morning. On the occasion when Jesus told a parable about three individuals, two of which were Jews. One was a Levite, one was a priest. Both came upon a man who had been stripped, beaten, and left for dead, robbed of everything he had. And they crossed the road and walked the other side. But the Samaritan, the half-breed, the despised individual, stopped his donkey, got off, picked the man up, put some of his clothes on him, put some of his oil and wine upon him, took him to an inn, left him, and told the innkeeper, let him stay here until he gets well. And if there is more owed, I'll stop back by and settle up with you. What we have before us today in this account is Jesus showing himself to be the good Samaritan. So this man, wanting to justify himself, he came to Jesus and he began to question him. What must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus simply said, well, what's your interpretation of it? You're an expert of the law. Well, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength, your whole being, and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus says, great, you answered correctly. Now go do likewise, and you shall live. But the man, see, was hoping to, to stump Jesus, because he was the expert, right? To make Jesus look poor. But he couldn't. So to save face, he says, well, well who is my neighbor? And again, Jesus then tells the parable that we had of the Good Samaritan. But Jesus was the Good Samaritan. So, I want to pick up reading with verse 7. If you'd like to stand again, please, and give stretch your legs, keep you awake this morning. Begin reading with verse 7. A woman of Samaria came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink of me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. And Jesus answered and said to her, Oh, if you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman's pretty savvy. She can see. She said, well, sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us this well, and he also drank of it himself, as well as his sons and all of their livestock? And Jesus answered and said to her, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a well or a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me some of this water that I may not thirst, nor come here to draw. And Jesus said, Well, go call your husband and come here. And the woman answered and said, I have no husband. 
And Jesus said, well, you've well said you have no husband. You've had five husbands, and the man you're living with now, you're not married to. He's not your husband. So in that, you truly spoke. And the woman said, sir, I perceive, perceive you're a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain. See how she diverted the attention away from herself right there? She said, sir, I perceive you're a prophet, but our fathers worshipped on this mountain. And you Jews say that Jerusalem is the place to worship. And Jesus said, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain or in Jerusalem people will worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. This is what Jesus was explaining to Nicodemus, by the way. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. And the woman said to him, Well, I know the Messiah is coming, and when he does, he'll tell us all these things. Oh, listen to these words. And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. And at this point, his disciples came back. And they marveled that he was talking to this woman. But no one dared ask him, what are you doing? What do you seek? Or why are you talking to her? The woman then left her water pot. And she went her way into the city. And she said to the men, come and see a man who told me all things that I ever did. Could this be the Christ? Then they went out of the city and they came to him. You may be seated. Our text tells us today that at noontime, the hottest part of the day, see it started when the sun rose, so say it rose at 6 o'clock, the sixth hour would put it right at noon. So the hottest part of the day, this woman comes. That tells us so much about this story. I won't get into it all, but at the hottest part of this day, of the day, this woman comes alone from the city, to get water. And like the man in the parable of the Good Samaritan, who had been beaten up, left along the road for dead, this woman had been beaten up by society, discarded as worthless. Did she make some of those choices? Absolutely. But she was considered unclean and a societal outcast left along the road, as it were, for dead. And yet Jesus said, I need to go through Samaria because I have a divine appointment. And Jesus, as the good Samaritan, took time to tend to her wounds, introduce the healing balm to her that she needed to make her well. The Jews had no love for the Samaritans, no concern for their spiritual well-being. Well, remember, John had introduced Jesus as the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, as the light that comes into the world. And here, Jesus is revealing himself as the living water. And it's tempting to focus on his deity here. But consider with me for Son of Man. At his birth, we beheld his humility, lying in a manger. But we discovered his divine glory too, for the angels announced this one to be born as Christ the Lord. We see him one time in a boat, asleep, exhausted from a day of heavy toil. And yet he stands and with a word stills the storm. On another occasion we see him standing by the grave of his beloved friend Lazarus. It tells us, that he was groaning in the spirit and weeping. And yet in the next breath, everybody is worshiping him. As with, again, a word, he brings forth the dead to life. And so it is written for us here today. He is weary from his journey. Yet displaying his deity, he reveals all the secrets of this woman's heart in revealing himself to be the living water. He sat by the well resting, thirsting as a man, yet doing what he came to earth to do, 
seeking and saving lost souls. If you're ever going through a trial and someone comes up to you and says, oh, I know what you're going through, and yet you know they have never gone through anything like what you're going through, you have a hard time relating to them. But see our Savior? We have a Savior who was tempted in every way as we are, as men, as people. He knew what it was like to be hungry, to thirst, to groan in anguish in the spirit at the loss of a loved one. And in our text today, we see a Savior who was weary as a man. He comes and seeks out a woman who is also weary. They can relate to one another. And though she sees him as just a man, he's revealing himself to be more than a man, but the son of man, and offers her living was is, re, is revealing who he is. And notice, it's not to the religious elite in Jerusalem. Who is Jesus revealing himself to? The worst of the city of Samaria, perhaps. A Samaritan woman, a castaway from society. That's the heart of the Lord Jesus Christ. He comes not to reveal himself to the religious elite who have no time for him, but to the weary, to the worn out, to the afflicted, to sinful individuals. Which category do you fall into? Whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water, bubbling up into everlasting life. The Lord uses an analogy of a spring because he knows that's something we're familiar with, just water coming up out of the ground. And yet he says it's going to burst forth like a geyser into everlasting life. And the wording used in the original text means life now and everlasting The very reason this woman came to the well was to get water. She got something far better than she actually came for, and she left her water. She forgot all about it, and she went to tell everybody about Jesus. This woman, who had been cast aside by society, gossiped about, sneered at, avoided, and yet she was so transformed that she became the first missionary to Samaria. And she ran down the streets telling everybody about Jesus. Well, we have represented in our text today, going back into chapter 3, two groups or two types of people. One type is satisfied. They're comfortable with their religion. They have it all worked out in their mind and in their daily practice. They feel no need for change or any alterations in their life. They've given what they want to give. They allow God to occupy the space that they're comfortable with Him occupying in their life. I wonder, does that describe you today? Does it describe me today? You see, because by and large, I think that describes the church in America today. People allow God to occupy a space that they determined that they're comfortable with. They determine when they're going to give, how much they're going to give, all of that. They have it all figured out. That was the religious people of Jesus' day. That's why they had no room for Jesus. Because he was like new wine in an old wineskin, right? He came to burst that all open. To transform lives. He does the same today. The last thing you're going to see the religious people doing is running down the street. Telling people they've met a man named Jesus that can transform their lives. Just thinking about that makes them uncomfortable. But we see two responses to Jesus from the Scriptures before us. One comes from people that that claim they possess God. They have a knowledge of God and a practice of Him all worked out in their life. Jesus comes along, and their response to Jesus is no. They have religion. They don't need Jesus. The other type here represented is one who's just going about their life perhaps less than satisfied with all that life has brought them. They've sought approval of men, and yet at the end of the day, they felt like they have no value, empty, but life goes on. 
They're not seeking God at all, just the things of this life. And Jesus introduces himself to both. The first says no emphatically. The second, as they hear Jesus' words, they're so transformed that they give no thought to self. They just know others need to hear and experience what they have. They cannot help but speak about the things that they've experienced, seen, heard themselves. Some will be like the Samaritan woman, heavy laden with the burdens of this world and willing to slide out from underneath them when given the opportunity to respond to the yoke that Jesus says you can take upon you that is easy, to come unto the gentle Savior and receive from him living water that will bubble up within them and become a fountain of everlasting life. Some will be like the Pharisees and say, no, no thank you, Jesus. Jesus said he would be divisive, that he would divide mothers, fathers, mothers, daughters, fathers, sons, brothers, sisters. Jesus transforms. Make absolutely no mistake about it. Jesus told Nicodemus, the Son of Man must be lifted up, that whoever looks at him, like the serpent in the wilderness, would be healed. He would become born again, or born from above, meaning given God's divine nature. And that divine nature would transform him as he took in the great and precious promises of the Word of God. And he would become more like God. Are you being transformed today by the renewing of your mind or do messages like this make you uncomfortable? Jesus said the hour is coming and now is when worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. And that's what the Father is seeking to worship him. For God is spirit and those who worship must do so in spirit and truth. What's he saying there? Outside of the bounds of perhaps organized religion, where there is no room for you to worship God as the Spirit would lead you, per se. Like the religious leaders who did everything. just They did not respond to the Holy Spirit. The hour is coming. The hour of this woman coming to the well corresponded with her spiritual condition. She was weary and parched in her soul. And Jesus needed to go through Samaria because he had a divine appointment with her. There are no accidents in this world that is presided over by a living, reigning God. Jesus knew her deepest need, and he was there to minister to it. He was there to overcome her prejudices, to subdue her prejudiced will, to extend an invitation of himself to her. Here was one who had been the center of heaven's glory, now dwelling in a world of sin and suffering. Here is one in whom the Father delighted, the Scripture tells us, now enduring the contradiction of sinners. The man humbled himself. Among the Jews, it was considered degradation to even hold a conversation with a Samaritan, let alone be beholden to them for a favor. That wouldn't be tolerated at all. But here we find the Lord of glory asking for a drink of water from one of the worst in the city of Samaria. Such was his condensation that this woman herself was made to marvel. Jesus, the Son of Man, offers of himself to each one of us today. He offers the living water that when accepted, becomes a fountain bubbling up within our hearts, like a a light set on a hill that cannot be hidden. This fountain bubbling up is evidence of transformation, evidence that we have not religion but relationship with the one who is the way, the truth, and the life. I pray that the Holy Spirit will use the message of this passage to bring you face to face today with the reality of who you think you are versus who you really are? Are we more like the Pharisees, comfortable 
with just how much we're going to give to God and how much we're going to allow Him in our lives. Or are we like the Samaritan woman, weary, parched, willing to receive the words of Jesus, take that living water that He offers and let it become within us a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. And so excited by the offer that we simply must tell everyone about the one who offers it. Let's pray. Father, I pray indeed that you would take these words, the the scenario painted before us here, as we see Jesus, weary as a man, sitting by a well, to engage another weary individual and to offer her living water. That same water is offered to each one of us today. All too often, Father, we have everything just the way we want it because that's the way we're comfortable. And we don't surrender all. We surrender some. I pray today that the theme of our heart would be, I surrender all. As we receive the words of Christ, as we take the living water, this woman had tried approval of men and was left empty. And so it is with us. We try and seek the approval of neighbors, of friends, of the community, and in the end, we're left empty. As exciting as winning a state tournament softball championship is soon the trophy will gather dust soon there will be an emptiness because it is only the living water that satisfies help us lord to forsake the comfortable and accept in your word which helps us become partakers of your divine nature to live that out, to go excited to pickle days and to other things that we have opportunity to do in the community, excited for what Jesus has done in our hearts and our lives and what he can do for others. Help us in this endeavor, I pray. The power of your Spirit, in Jesus' name, amen. Let's turn in our songbooks this morning to 325.